Take, for instance, this notion that mind is not brain, that mind is filtered through and reduced by brain, and that mind is, is somehow cosmic in nature and not simply human or not simply psychological or neurological. That idea could revolutionize how we think about ourselves. The standard model in uh, neuroscience today is that consciousness or awareness, that is you, is really a, a kind of epiphenomenon or a kind of froth, uh, a very sophisticated uh, synchronized froth on the top of these neurons and this brain that's generating this illusion of a self. And we're really just matter uh, bouncing around. A few years ago, I was invited by historian of religions, Jeff Kripal, to document a symposium at the Esalen Institute's Center for Theory and Research, or CTR. The symposium was part of the CTR's Sursum series. Sursum is short for survival seminar. A good, honest neuroscientist will tell us that to this day, we have no idea what consciousness is. We really have no idea. Um, and that it's quite possible that it is not in the brain. And that's precisely the position of this Sursan group. If that, in fact, is the case, the implications are massive. The first implication is that when the brain, of, of course, stops and decays in physical death, it doesn't necessarily mean mind stops. And then can we use those models to talk about things like life after death and um, memories of previous uh, incarnations and out-of-body experiences and all of the things that are, are in the literature. At least it allows us to begin thinking about ourselves in richer ways. We have a set of religious traditions that are all too certain of who we are and, and where we're going. And then we have all of these very powerful sciences that uh, have given us so much, but in the process have reduced us to machines, have reduced us to, to only matter, and to only mechanism. Supernature attempts to move between and beyond these polarities of reason and belief. Perched 100 feet atop a Pacific Coast cliff in Big Sur, California, sits the Esalen Institute. Every year, around 14,000 visitors come here from all over the globe to explore richer, deeper, and healthier ways of being. Esalen offers an eclectic array of nearly 500 workshops that are open to the public and designed to help people forge new understandings of themselves and the world we share. In contrast, the symposia held by the Center for Theory and Research are small invitation-only affairs in which some of the world's most renowned scholars 
gather to share and discuss ideas considered taboo in the more formal settings of the academy and the church. These two sides of Esalen, the intellectual and the experiential, are a direct lineage of the Institute's founders, Michael Murphy and Richard Price. Murphy envisioned an intellectual ashram where East and West, science and spirit could meet and merge. Price sought a healing center, a safe space where those who had been abused by the psychiatric establishment, as he had been, or by life itself, could come and be healed through community and an integration of mind, body, and emotion. Today, Esalen is the mother of all human growth centers in the United States, part healing retreat center, part alternative think tank. Esalen was founded for a lot of reasons, but most of the reasons boiled down to an attempt to take things that had been separated in American and Western culture and not just unite them in any simple fashion, but sort of move beyond them into a greater space. And, and so those ma main pairs were science and religion, East and West, and spirit and body. I would say that Esalen is a conversation. You have to put all these things together that are artificially held apart in our culture the heart, the mind, the spirit, the body, and the relational community. All of those are essential elements. When you put them all together, you have a cross-domain conversation. You invite people like CTR has been doing for 50 years to come that represent different parts of a conversation that needs to be happening. Or you come to a workshop and maybe one part of yourself enters into conversation with another part of yourself or you learn how to relate to another person and that sparks something. Esalen is a worldwide community and it's a state of mind. And for me, it represents incubation and midwifery of new concepts and ideas that can be fertilized. The founders, Michael and Dick, believed in plurality. There shouldn't be just one driving idea. There should be a lot of ideas and a place where ideas are tossed around. So often I'd be hiking with Dick Price and we'd get in some conversation and he would say, well, Michael and I have this joke between us. We call Esalen Inkblot Institute because it's everybody's projection of what they either want it to be or don't want it to be or think is good about it or think is evil about it. My projection, my Esalen has changed, you know, many times. I see Esalen in a larger context, I think, now than I did in originally. I see it in the context first of Big Sur and the San Lucia Mountains. It's kind of beyond belief all that in this relatively small area on the cliff at this westernmost frontier of, of the uh, continent, but facing east, you have the the Pacific Ocean and it's sort of infinitude and you've got the, the great night sky and you've got the, the cliffs converging with the sea and the hot springs coming from the womb of the earth. You've got the redwoods and the canyons and the, the waterfall. It's paradise, the closest you can get to heaven. I don't like to come here too often because it, 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 I get high when I'm here. You know, I don't need to take drugs. I, my, my body is all shaking and quivering and, and I'm always on the edge of, of um, fainting. And it's just a, a magical place. I love it. <laughs> I love Esalen. The place is, is physically awesome. 
I can walk through the gardens and then other areas on the grounds at Aslan and think that the ground is feeding me through my feet, that I'm actually getting energy that's sustaining energy. Eslan, then, this name we've given it, this institute is plunked down there, but it's plunked down there in the context of this incredible natural environment that I think is the base of what really sustains what goes on there. Anyone who's driven down the Pacific Coast Highway through Big Sur will tell you how remarkably beautiful it is. Tourists park along the side of the road for miles, taking in the scenery. By the time you arrive at Eslin, you're dizzy, slightly intoxicated, and you feel a definite energy. And then you stop and ask yourself, at least I did, is it all in my mind? And if mind is not limited to skull, what does that even mean? There was a Bolivian shaman here many years ago doing a workshop, a guy named Shamalu. His word for what's uh, going on here is, you know, some powerful, energetic thing. Being a geophysicist, I'm very skeptical of, you know, geomantic bullshit. <laughs> and uh, yet yeah, have had some great experiences that my education would uh, say that can't happen. I'm a pretty skeptical person. I'm not usually open to this kind of thing. I was just standing there kind of minding my own business, just looking up at the stars. All of a sudden, I got real quiet and still, and, and everything else got real quiet and still. And my, my field of vision narrowed. And I watched these three golden orbs emerge from the ground and rise up and hover at about waist height. I was kind of locked into them. I, you know, I was really, really um, drawn to them, but I wasn't scared. I was really peaceful and calm. And I just kind of watched these really beautiful, kind of indescribably luminescent orbs float there. Henry Miller used to write about these Big Sur glowing balls that people would see around. These orbs really uh, opened my mind up. It really shifted my thinking on that kind of encounter with stuff that I can't explain. There's a historical fact that is relevant here. Esalen was named after the Esalen Indians, who for centuries inhabited this land. The ground from which Stuart saw the orbs rise is an ancient Indian burial ground. Imagine being a Native American walking up the coastline, and all of a sudden there's hot water pumping out of the rock. And so here on this property, there's multiple burial sites. This is definitely one of their most sacred sites. Eslin is a sacred healing center. There is an energy there that when people arrive and are there, it heals. They become more aware of their body, their mind, their emotions, their energetics, and their relational capacities. People have a spiritual awakenings and they look completely different and they've shed their trauma and their wounds. And I think that's the purest form of what Eslin offers to the world is um, that transformative experience.
it's a place of healing, it's a place it's of transformation, it's a place of love. It's a place of connecting and being present and really slowing down and dropping in and listening. It's a place of joy and excitement and exuberance and, um, and grief, and like the whole full spectrum of life, you know? Essendon is this place that I think allows a lot of space. Space for exploration, space for experimentation, space to try on something different than what we know. This is a space to try on, through direct experience, the full possibilities of how we might be human, the full possibilities of how we might be engaged with this world and with ourselves. I was amazed at the Esalen catalog back then. It was just totally fascinating. Esalen is a laboratory of human possibilities. And I loved it. I loved Esalen. I was completely astonished by the place, its layers of people, and, and the workshops, and the teachers, and the history, and the physical beauty. And it was so powerful. It, nothing in my life compared in magnetism or attraction to the pull that the place had for me back then. Over the last almost 40 years now, I've, I've, I've collected and, and carried with me all of these books and papers from the research and archiving that, that we've done. And I, as you get older, you pair things back till you're really as lean as possible, but there are things that I just can't do away with. I have about 60 boxes here filled with about two thirds to three quarters of them are Esalen related books, papers, tapes, the, the tapes of all the Spiegel, Spiegelberg lectures, uh, memorabilia, all kinds of sacred objects that have been given to me. And I'm not sure what I, what I will do with them, but they're they, I can't part with them. To grow up at Esalen was an incredible treasure. It was fun, and we were outside, and we were exposed to a lot of ideas. Um, and a lot of amazing people. And we were free in a way that we had no idea. But some of that freedom was really dangerous, too. Esalen was an experiment. Esalen is an incredible community of people that are very um, loving and kind and eccentric. And it's also a place of rebels, of people who are like, fed up with the status quo and go like, OK, we got to change something. I got to do some things different. Basically, they broke all the rules. Just wipe them all clean. The culture's screwed up, so we're just going to start clean, revisit everything. Some of the projects that were happening were exquisite and authentic and beautiful and disciplined and real. And a lot of them were absolute bullshit. And as kids, we knew the difference. It was a social experiment, you know? They, and I'm super lucky that it went really well. It could have gone really bad. It would be a mistake to think of Esalen as a conflict-free utopia. Politics are as much a fact of life here as anywhere. But Esalen's ethos of open-mindedness and awareness have taught those who've journeyed here to do a simple thing well, to sit in a circle with humility and talk. Any people 
can sit down and start to notice in this moment as best they can and offer each other support without interference, without interpretation, without analysis, with goodwill, with inquiry, with patience, with tolerance, and together can discover and wake up. Dick said this is primarily about the quality of awareness we're bringing to our life. It's how you're learning to notice whatever that is. How to show up. I uh, first came to Esalen in uh, 84 and proceeded to have the most remarkable month of my life. Remarkable in ways that uh, I can't fully express. And it opened my mind to a vastly larger reality than I had previously known. This place has saved my life, it certainly changed my life. When I have returned here, uh, I've usually been in a fairly delicate sort of place and uh, was, I came here held by, yes, individual friends, but the place also. This is where Esalen Institute takes its water from the creek. And uh, we're about 600 foot elevation. For years, this has been known as the source. I spent a lot of time back here with Dick, hiking. That's really how I got to know Dick, because he loved to hike, and not many people could keep up with him. We, we hiked all over these mountains. We spent a lot of time exploring external wildernesses, places like this, places that very few people have ever walked to, because we would go off trail, we would go off route. And then we spent a lot of time in internal terrain that not many people go to. And the two things didn't seem separate to me. It felt like something about exploring the edge of what we know, both internally and externally. And it felt at times like if we went far enough out into this wilderness, it was very much an inner journey. And when we did these really internal journeys, it was very much an external you know, journey and exploration out here. Being exposed to so many different practices at Esalen opened me up to the fact that spirit and consciousness was not just living in my brain, inside of my skull, but it was living in my breath as I was executing an Aikido technique or as I was exploring uh, you know, the inner depths of who I was through Gestalt awareness practice or later in life when I was executing management practice by running companies. Your consciousness is not just lodged in that brain. It extends throughout your body, extends beyond your body, and then begins to touch other people. Once you made that, that major distinction, which is I don't end at my fingertips, then a huge amount of the world opened up and a whole lot of new things made sense. It was all right to transcend your identity. Jim Fadiman became a subset of who I am. And that larger identity does not have the same very limited belief system and limited capacities uh, that he, he does. I spent many, many years in this room helping people get in touch with the part of themselves that's psychic. And that's, of course, an outgrowth of the work we did at Stanford Research Institute, where for 25 years we had a program supported by the government in which we spent half our time 
trying to understand how psychic abilities work. If I can sit in a chair here at Esalen and describe what's happening back in my home in Palo Alto, it shows that my awareness is able to transcend our ordinary understanding of distance. The existence of a robust phenomena like remote viewing indicates that to some extent we misapprehend the nature of the space time we live in. And modern physics explores uh, models that would allow that, multidimensional models, where that path off the physical plane has no distance. Soon after its founding, Esalen's spirit of exploration and freedom began drawing an astonishing array of intellectuals, artists, musicians, and literati, making it a locus of the emerging 1960s American counterculture. You can just think of it as this kind of earthquake that went off in culture and affecting every part of human life. And Esalen was playing such a, a critical role in that because on the one hand, it was reflecting this explosion that was so creative and rebellious and, and adventurous. But it also, I think, because it was concentrating so many remarkable people in, a, in an amazing place, it then had a catalyzing influence on this bigger explosion that was happening. Esalen harnessed the rebellious energy of the counterculture to become a mecca of the human potential movement, a broadband of ideas and practices whose basic claim is that human beings possess immense, untapped reserves of consciousness and energy that cultures have repressed in different ways, but that we today can actualize and develop into a more integral vision of an evolving supernature with the right teachings and practices. The practice element at Esalen was very important. That is, people were not just talking about things. Many ideas became tested and developed and practiced. It was like this ideal laboratory for these, for these things to really uh, evolve. I think Esalen really made it possible for me to help create a field. There, there was just no place, or no audience for this kind of stuff. 40 years ago, um, and no place to gather. So both the opportunity to draw people here, outstanding, interesting people who, who had busy lives, they would come to Esalen without being paid huge amounts of money because they enjoyed the process. So, uh, and, and to come here and be able to say anything uh, really created the possibility of creating a new field. And then over the years has created a possibility to really beginning stages of really interesting research in, in the area of the body and body practices. I was like lots of academic people. The intellect really developed like hell and just neurotic and undeveloped at other levels. And one of the main consequences of many visits to Esalen is being put in touch with and doing some learning of more experiential kinds of knowledge. I learned that I had a body, I learned that I had a heart through encounter work, and as a result, it made me much more wide spectrum in my approach to life. What made Esalen so magical was the integration of Dick and Mike. They were so different, and yet there was such synergy in their debates on different topics and deciding what to do. We kind of agreed that we're like two guys with the overlap, a big overlap and some significant differences. Dick was the healer and the man of the earth, and Mike was the visionary and the intellectual and the, the person who would carry Esalen out into the world. But what made Esalen work so beautifully was that you need this full spectrum to engage the whole person because we're all of these things. In the early 1950s, Murphy and Price were attending Stanford University, where they both encountered and were influenced by Frederick Spiegelberg. Spiegelberg was a professor of comparative religion who espoused a paradoxical notion that he called the religion of no religion. This potent little phrase is best translated today as the choice to be spiritual but not religious. 
an ethos deeply instilled into the culture of Veselin by its founders over 50 years ago. With no official alliance with any religious system, Veselin's religion of no religion provides a space where almost any religious form can flourish, provided it does not attempt to impose itself on the entire community or claim to speak for everyone. As an early Esselin motto put it, no one captures the flag. I think that if people realize that they have a body and that body needs to be taken care of, they have an emotional self and that needs to be educated. You know, the mind is trained to think rationally and linearly, but the emotional self can be educated. And, uh, you know, people can learn, in the way you can learn how to play a musical instrument and have a more sophisticated sense of art and aesthetic appreciation, you can also learn to have stronger interpersonal relationships and you can boost your aptitude for transpersonal experience, you know, through meditation and time in nature and, well, a myriad ways, right? Music, uh, dance, you can be trained to transcend the limited mind and plug into what is more absolute and fundamental in yourself. And uh, Esalen is all about that. Esalen is really saying, you're not a brain in a jar, you're a complex being. Like uh, Huxley said, we're multiple amphibians. We live in various worlds, physical worlds, metaphysical worlds, emotional worlds. And so we can be educated in all those ways. So I see Esalen as like, um, an experimental station. What works, what doesn't work, what after 50 years still sticks to the wall. Esalen was a place that was saying, here is a place where all ideas can be explored. Nobody's capturing the flag. New ideas are always welcome. Let's explore them in an open-minded way. And out of cross-pollinating lots of different viewpoints and traditions, even getting them to bump up against each other, even getting some arguments started is very healthy for spiritual growth. It's not about sublimating yourself to a particular doctrine, a dogma. It's about uh, rolling up your sleeves and doing some hard work, some hard analysis on, is this useful? It's a very simple concept, but it's incredibly powerful and it unleashes a huge amount of energy and I saw this at Esalen. It seemed to be the operating principle of the place, and it was what gave it such vitality and open-endedness and excitement of exploration. This is a place where people can grow, transform, and get even a taste of what their true nature is all about. We all have the spark of the divine within, and that spark of the divine is also being expressed out into the world. At Esalen, I think people have a chance to get that sense of that soul that lives within them and have a chance to learn more about it, uh, awaken to it, actually bring it forth into the world in their work, in their relationships. And I think so Esalen is a place where people can relax, be at home, and awaken to their divine nature. In more than a half century of radical exploration and experimentation, hundreds of thousands of people have visited and been inspired by Esalen, creating a worldwide network of seekers and thinkers. Esalen and the Human Potential Movement have helped carve out new, spiritually infused streams of inquiry and action in psychology, healthcare, business, religion, politics, and the environment. In the 1960s, many of the practices and ideas Esalen stood for were considered novel. Today, they are taken for granted by much of our public culture. 
I mean, I think that if you look at uh, Esalen as a crucible, then all of these different therapies and explorations that have come out of there could form very valuable curricula, not only at the college level, but at the elementary school level, at the preschool level, at, the, at every level, that uh, there's really, really valuable information there. I think that's what it's about. It has been a great vehicle for my work and the work of many others who uh, believe that the human potential is far, far beyond what uh, our parents and our churches and our schools even have taught us to explore into the undiscovered country of human possibility. Not only to explore that, but to address problems that cannot be solved unless we go deeper, unless we go into the undiscovered country. Aldous Huxley put it this way, nothing less than everything will do if we're gonna attack the big human problems. We need to throw everything at it. The backdrop for all this is physicalism. Uh, and by physicalism, I mean the doctrine that currently governs practically everything going on in psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy of mind in particular. Led by neuroscientist Ed Kelly, Sersum produced two large academic volumes that lay a scientific foundation for the group's ideas, Irreducible Mind and Beyond Physicalism. It's certainly part of Esalen's kind of remit to try to foster positive change in society, and I'm all for it. Uh, I feel no personal responsibility for it in the sense that, I mean, I just want to help bring these ideas forward, uh, show their value from a scientific point of view, and hope, you know, that something good can come of it. Certainly, there will be lots of individuals, I think, for whom these kinds of ideas will be salvation, basically, you know. Give them sustenance in an otherwise pretty wretched desolate kind of intellectual landscape. These ideas that have been birthed or nurtured at Esalen are ideas of hope, and they're ideas of the future. All our attributes, all our attributes, are pressing to express themselves in this greater way. That's who we secretly are. We're part of this machine that wants to make us gods.